whether there was any national celebrations yesterday. Let's begin with um, a quick introduction on what you do as far as um, making awareness on menstrual hygiene is concerned. Let me start with you, Angela, now that you're next to me. Um, so we have an organization called Hills for Pads Foundation. Yeah. It's been running for four years now. We actually celebrated our fourth birthday this month. Um, so predominantly our focus is on ensuring girls don't miss school. Mm -hmm. So we have a project called Adopter Dispenser where we put a pad dispenser in schools um, and a girl is given an NFC enabled card. Uh, every time she swipes she gets 12 swipes per month mm -hmm. and the school is given an emergency in case that girl needs more or if there's a new girl who started their menstruation and they're not uh, onboarded on their program. We also support them with menstrual health education and uh, in addition to that, we like to go to different parts of the country to understand the challenges around menstrual health. So we distribute uh, the sustainable options uh, in case we can't go back to so reusable pads because mm -hmm. uh, we also have a project around that. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, journey uh, we've been able to support over 20,000 beneficiaries which has also let us know how it's important to have the conversation of menstrual health you cannot have the conversation of sexual health if you're not yeah. having the conversation of menstrual health both are intertwined right and um, um, Winnie you had said earlier on that um, off air that you've been having this campaign the entire month maybe you can tell us uh, what you've been focusing on okay yeah so um, the Kenya Girl Guides Association is um, is the largest girl guide only organization in Kenya. Mm. So um, this month is called the MHM month. We started our celebrations on the, on the first of May. So how we are able to or how we approach menstrual hygiene when it comes to the organization is through uh, we have a, a course book. We call it Roses World. So it was uh, developed by Wash United, but it was adopted by the World Association of Girl Guides. So this World Association of Girl Guides is now using this course book currently in 12 countries mm -hmm. through a program called the Yes Program. It is an exchange program. You All right. All right. And I'll, I'll come back to you uh, shortly. Um, let me hear from Jen. Uh, Jen, your organization uh, deals with girls from the slums. All right. And we know the many challenges that um, people living in slums, especially women, have to go through. How big of a problem is menstrual hygiene uh, in slums? Our menstrual hygiene is a huge problem in the slums. Mm. I remember that in the slums we don't have enough toilets. There is no privacy in their houses. So it's just a big prob problem, yeah. yeah, because the girls, even in schools, most of their washrooms are shared. So you can imagine a menstruating girl in the toilet organizing herself and there's a boy waiting to come into the toilet. Not even a boy, even if it's a girl, you know. Period is still uh, considered very secret in this country. So it's, it's a big problem. First, they cannot access their sanitary towers the way they should. The hygiene situation is t terrible. The privacy is not there. So it's just a general problem that mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to tackle yeah. to the latter. Yeah. yeah, and we've seen the statistics that we have from the World Bank, from the UNFPA, that over 5 million people are not able to access uh, the menstrual, um, let me say menstrual hygiene products, because majority of them will use uh, rugs. I know we all have a story mm. um, when it comes to menstrual hygiene, we've both been affected in one way or another. But just before we talk about what our story is like, let's get uh, go back to yesterday. Mm. It was the, the, the global celebrations for Menstrual Hygiene Day and just like any other important day like World Cancer Day, um, World um, Hand Wash Day for example, we see the various ministries which represent the government uh, holding such celebrations but yesterday it was organizations like yours uh, holding celebrations and, and so people will ask do we have a goodwill from the government because it all starts with the government, Angela. Yes, it yeah. does all start with the government. Yeah. There's a school that we support and uh, the, where the dispenser is, and they, they've gotten pads. They got pads from the government. So we, when we got there, we were like, oh, where to get these pads from? And then they said that it was given to them as the government project. I said, so how long? Um, so there were about under 500 packets, and they're supposed to last them for two years. So... Um, that's not sufficient. That's impossible. Um, if we were all to say how many packets we use, on average, most women will probably use 12 pieces um, on the higher side or maybe even two packets, right? So if 
that's supposed to last a school that has about 170 girls who are menstruating. How is that supposed to happen? Yeah. How are you supposed to ensure that a, a parent feels that they are safe, that they, their child can, if, if they can't afford to buy the pads, mm. that their child has access. So if our organizations uh, like the ones that are sitting here don't exist, that mm. are not counteracting what is already happening, then we do have issues that we will talk about, like the FGM, the early marriage, mm. children not going to school, being vulnerable and sex for pads, where you know you find somebody who's willing mm. to pay something in return for uh, a favor. So these conversations need to be had and organizations like ourselves need to challenge the government to see what they're doing and do more and not slash the budget like they did last year, uh, where it went uh, from from 460, I believe, to now 260 million. How are we mm. supposed to help yeah. um, girls if that's a scenario? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, Winnie, were you surprised that uh, the government, uh, I'm not sure whether I should uh, call out the Minister of Health, Gender, or even Sanitation, because uh, menstrual hygiene revolves around those, uh, at least those three ministries, but were you surprised that there was no a national um, event that would make a better awareness on menstrual hygiene among Kenyans? Yes, I was very surprised yeah. because you find like Kenya, we are not to be the only country that has a uh, menstrual hygiene management strategy uh, on its own standing alone that involves private and different stakeholders we are known for that i think in kenya we have very good policies very well thought out policies but the problem is is in the implementation and if something as small as recognizing the 28th may yeah. is not being done how then are we going to follow the policies that are already in place mm -hmm. yeah all right and uh, how what's your take on the same um you know Jen, because most of the time organizations like yours join the national government to make and other donors to make awareness on menstrual hygiene but it's on a sunday and there are no activities across uh, any ministries in the governments and so What's your take on that and where were you? What were you doing yesterday? <laughs> yeah. yeah I, think, I think we are yet to acknowledge that this is supposed to be a national conversation. Yeah. We are yet to understand the magnitude of menstrual hygiene conversation. Because if we can miss out on such an activity, if we cannot get the voice of the government, I'm talking about the head of government on this issue, then I don't think we know that we understand the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. We are talking about 40% of girls missing, uh, you know, who have never used the, the, the menstrual hygiene products. Like where, where, where is this data and how was it done? Because if we are talking about 40% of girls, how many girls are those if we are looking at the uh, population of girls in this country? So I think as a country we are here to take this seriously, not knowing that this is something that affects us all. And I'm not talking about poverty. When we are talking about menstruation, then we are talking about everyone with a womb, you know, yeah. apart from those who have gone into menopause. So it is something that we should all take very, very seriously, whether rich or poor. It's not just about access. We're also talking about hygiene. We are talking about infections related to yeah. menstruation. So it's not something that should just be taken for granted. By the way, we are all products of menstruation. Yeah. Without menstruation, we cannot exist. Yeah. So it should not just be taken like any other thing. We must take it very seriously. Yeah, and um, especially the fact that you're coming um, from a place, a rural place or, uh, a, you know, a, a rural place or mm. even a slum area, mm. I do understand and know how much difficult it is, not just even for the girls, the fact that even the parents, the guardians are not even aware that some of these products exist and then we are not seeing the government coming out and making awareness and reaching out to them and telling them it's okay to use these products. I, 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 I don't know what to say in that regard, but let's talk about um, uh, Heels for Pads, for instance. Um, like I said, every woman has a story. Yes in regard to menstrual hygiene. Yes. It's, the statistics are so huge that over 500 million uh, women currently cannot access um, the menstrual hygiene products. And so that has affected one of us mm -hmm. or all of us mm -hmm. negatively. So Heels for Pads, did you, um, was this foundation founded um, out of experience that you went through this and therefore now that you are in a stable place, you don't, you don't want to see another girl going through that or what was the idea behind it? We have an organization called Sister Speaks Global mm -hmm. and focuses on female events and using um, the digital space to amplify women's stories. So as part of our CSR, 
um, my uh, co-founder Monica she had some heels she wanted to give them away and then um, but like her, her closest to her like her nieces and her younger cousins their feet are too small so she came to myself and our other business uh, partner um, Angela and asked us if you have heels and what if we you know ask people to um, get our heels in exchange for pads so that's why it's called heels for pads so it started as a CSR but in our in our journey of of going through this journey of building heels for pads foundation we've come to realize the the importance of it so so for me I don't don't have a negative story when it comes to menstruation but what I have learned is that my story is one of privilege and one one that I should talk about which is um, most people don't don't go don't approach their fathers or their or their boyfriends or their partners or their brothers because it's a it's a woman's problem yeah. mm-hmm. but i realized that mine is one that's a positive like my i started my periods with my father i talk about this all the time and um he w- he took me to the suit i mean i was panicking in the toilet thinking mm-hmm. oh am i gonna have this conversation with my dad but when i told him he's like cool i'll just take you to the supermarket i don't know what you need i'll show you that i'll pick what you need and now many years later i realized that mine is uh, mine, what I thought was normal because he's my father is actually not a normal conversation and mm. I always say there's the word men in menstruation for a reason yeah. so as part of one of the th- agendas of um, Heels for Pads is to include men in the conversation mm-hmm. so as, as she rightly said that we are all product of our missing period so we cannot omit men in this conversation and so we need to invite them, include them and also look at ourselves, when you're mm. going to the toilet are you hiding your pad mm. or are you shown in display, so look at our actions and include men, have these conversations conversation teach boys about puberty as well mm-hmm. as providing menstrual awareness so all that mm-hmm. is really really important so there's no no one has like a sad story per se but what all I can say is that through this journey we've realized the importance of also menstrual f- menstrual health education yeah. but at the same time the facts and figures that we're showing are things that happened before covid yeah. and they're also research done by people who don't live in africa who mm-hmm. don't live in kenya per se mm-hmm. so we need to also have the opportunity to tell the african stories of what is really really happening yeah. and what the actual figures are mm-hmm. as, as she's saying you know 40 percent. but what is the actual, actual figure actual right. figures right. and what's the story of the the girl in north and north eastern kenya mm. the girl in south eastern kenya the girl who lives in the city all have very different mm. experiences and different challenges that's right yeah and um, for you winnie as as an association kenya girl guides association maybe um this initiative on reaching out to uh, schools and girls and supporting them maybe what was the idea behind it did you see a gap or a problem that girls are going through or was it a personal problem that you also wanted to uh, bridge that gap okay yeah. So as, as said before, the association runs so many programs, mm. but it is when you're running these programs that you realize the, the, the gaps. For example, you may have a program and then maybe this week you had um, 30, let's say 30 students in this, in this classroom. Yeah. Maybe you go then the next week you find there are five absent girls. Data shows that, that about um, a million school going kids, girls in Kenya, miss four school days in a year a million girls can you imagine so um the part of the advocacy is not only giving them the ed- the education surrounding menstruation it's also showing them products for example uh, how we approach the how we approach the the menstrual hygiene topic is taking them through the instance of body changes body confidence we now get to the place of taboos and then we get to the place of products but now let's come to the products products um we talk about disposable pads We talk about reusable pads, we talk about menstrual cups, we talk about tampons, but we also don't talk about the stigma that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. Like for example, telling a young girl in primary school to insert a menstrual cup Mm -hmm. or to use a tampon, and then you see this whole agenda of virginity. So it's quite a sensitive issue of which that is a cheaper cheaper solution because you find like a menstrual cup can last for five years when it's taken care how it's supposed to be. We give them the reusable pad, which is another cheaper option compared to the disposable one but now the reusable pad requires that the girl has access to to 
clean water. Yeah. It means that the weather conditions have to be favorable because yeah. if the weather conditions are not favorable, meaning uh, natural ways of, of uh, killing bacteria like the sun, yeah. for example, um, it means this girl, you're now giving her a solution that is exposing her to things like UTIs, yeah. uh, yeast infections. So this um, whole topic is, uh, or rather, why we do all this is just to give the girls options. Mm. Because uh, we talk about period poverty as if it's something that happens so far. Mm. In Nairobi, we have gone to places, we visit places, and you're asking girls, uh, what do you use for, uh, yeah. for when you're having your periods? Do you know this bag, this people quote call yeah. Uhuru bag? Yeah. In Nairobi, there are girls who are using it to manage their menses, mm. besides using tissues, besides yeah. using what? And you know, this can only can only sustain them for so long. And then you see something like a tissue. You see every girl has different flows, yes? Um, even if they were to use tissue, assuming this one girl has um, very heavy flow, a very heavy flow, yeah, how is yeah. the tissue going to be sustainable? Yeah, so I think um, when we're talking about all these issues, everything is really, really interconnected. Yeah. With with all our problems. Mm -hmm. And as she's saying, we have seen firsthand, the, yes, there's provision of pads in public schools, but are they sustainable? Mm -hmm. Because the number of pieces, when you divide to, to, to the number of girls, and the number of time they've been given yeah. to use them, it, is, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes you can actually do the math and you find it's like a girl is accorded two, two, two pieces, yeah. two pads in a month which does not make any sense yeah. so i think we need to focus on more sustainable and more su more sustainable ways and also please try and make them affordable mm -hmm. try and make all of these products uh, affordable like why are we taxing pads why are we taxing or pads? free yeah. they don't have they to be, be. <laughs> <laughs> they can also be free because why are we taxing because yeah. it's not like an option you do not have an option yeah mm. even you if you decided i'm going to sleep the whole time <laughs> i won't <laughs> go anywhere yeah. you're still going to need products mm. so we need to 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 really make this and not to make this an issue it is an issue mm. because um lack lack of products is 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 also violating our human rights mm. In what sense? It means when the girl does not go to school, that is yeah. lack of basic education. It, it is also affecting health. When, the, when this girl get gets these infections, uh, infections yeah. gets period pains, that is, that is the right to health. Mm -hmm. We also have the right to work, where maybe, for example, if you have jobs that require for you to work in maybe in the forest, in a place that doesn't have access to toilets, you're going to overlook that job, yeah. meaning women are not really being empowered. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and you see, like she was saying about um, about transaction, sexual transaction, sexual favors. Mm. This happened, especially it really did hike up in, in the COVID time because now the kids are at home. Mm. Even that two pieces of pads I was saying, this girl no, no longer now has access to this because now the government was reaching the girl through the school, mm. but now the schools are closed. So the girls turned to, to predators. They're like, ah when you give me this then i can give you like a 50 bob or right. or 100 bob for you mm. to buy pads even go to the streets when you see all these uh, ladies who are in the streets mm. most of them have to like the, now the maybe the, the street boy who looks like he has it together yeah. now is going to ask for sex for so that they, he can actually buy this woman pads and now that has translated to a lot of sexual early pregnancies sexual uh, rape so it's, this issue is really not, it's no longer an issue about, yeah. and then imagine some countries are actually giving paid leaves, yeah? but as we're still talking about taboo yeah. and making it normal, <laughs> like when are we going to get to the point where now this girl, these things are actually now mm. happening? All right, yeah. we want to take a break. Of course, when you come back, Jen, we'll start with you. You'll tell us how Polycom is reaching out to um, women and girls in the slums and especially how the high cost of living is affecting access to some of these products. We take a short commercial break. We are back with this conversation, very important on uh, menstrual hygiene management. Stay with us.